Hello, I'm Guy, and this is Guy Robot. Hello, as you might remember from my last video, I recently tried to get an Amiga 600 I'd bought off eBay working, and it didn't work. As you might also remember, that now means I have two Amiga 600s, one of them shiny and white, and one of them that actually works. We'll ignore the shiny white one for now. So what I'm going to do today is actually do what I wanted to in the first video, and that's look at what actually is the Amiga 600. What did it mean for 16-bit computing in the United Kingdom back in the early 90s? The general consensus is that this bad boy bankrupt Commodore, probably one of the most influential 8-bit computer manufacturers that the United Kingdom had. And actually, they were really popular across Europe. The Amiga 600 sell loads in Germany, of all places. Don't really think it reached a lot of people in the States, though. But it was fundamentally just an Amiga 500 Plus. Apart from it lost the numeric keypad, and it was smaller, but the Amiga 500 Plus was a couple of years old. So, who would buy it? And the answer really was only people who still wanted an Amiga 500 Plus but didn't have one and had to buy this instead. Other than that, no one really got it. But it was pretty cool in many ways. It was tiny. I mean, if you look at the motherboards in this thing, I would have been impressed if a computer 10 years later could have had its technology shrunk down that size. And for the age and the power, the Amiga 500 Plus and 600 were phenomenal. I mean, you can put later operating systems on it and get online better than you can in a PC from five years later. They were really good. It's also all surface mounted for the technology. It reduces my repairability score on it massively because hey, I've got clunky hands and haven't got the right hardware. But again, years ahead at that time, thinking back to PCs in like 1992, there was still surface mount technology, although, sorry, there was still a through hole technology rather than surface mount. So it was ahead of its time. But it, other than the fact that it was small, it didn't bring a lot, and PC users at home didn't want small. This was the era where it was all about faster, and we were getting towards, actually, by the point this came out, wanting 32-bit architectures. And sadly, it's a computer that probably killed Commodore and the Amiga brand. What was a top-end graphics-based computer brand became nothing very quickly. Sorry, Amiga fans, but no one really cares. And that's a shame, because they were phenomenal at the time. However, this little of history should allow me to show you the peak of what I considered to be 16-bit computing back in circa 1992. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail today because I dare say you'll find much better videos of what the Amiga 600 could do. And there's all kinds of crazy hack videos you can find on YouTube. People who have overclocked them crazily, but adding boards into the things, got them online. Right, there's people that have already done that. I just want to do a really quick run through of what was an incredibly important computer in my life. I still remember actually being given this. It was one of the only times my parents have surprised me for Christmas. And they surprised me because they hid it in my bedroom, which is the one place I never thought to look for Christmas presents. So here we are. Let's take a look at getting running on the Amiga 600. So we're about to do it. Let's turn on the Amiga 600. Bang, there we are. That's how long it takes to boot. Wouldn't that be nice in a world today? I say boot, actually, this is at the point you need to choose what you want to run. So I haven't got the hard disk version, although there was a hard disk version available of it, which I still think is phenomenal for such a cheap computer of the era. So it's time for a floppy disk. Now notice this one says hard copy, do not use. That's because disks got corrupted. So supplying your operating system on disk was a weird thing to do. I never, however, paid any attention to that being a sensible idea and I just worked off the original floppy disk and what that did to me meant that when I filled up the floppy disk I was unable to actually delete anything from it as there seemed to be a weird bug in the operating system that if you had zero bytes free you couldn't delete files. Hmm. So whoever owned this one certainly knew more than me. To boot, pop it in. The hard disk, the floppy disk rather, scans and ticks constantly every second or so, so it knows as soon as you put a disk in, which is, I suppose, a nice touch. Even in the wonderful world of PCs, it's press any key to try again when it's trying to boot for a floppy disk. Yet, 20 years ago, 25 years ago even, that wasn't needed on the Amiga 600. 
What I am going to do here is quite a few jump cuts though, because booting takes a very long time, or should I say reading floppy disks takes a very long time. And otherwise, this entire video is going to be us watching loading screens. So, jump cut. Well, there we go. I managed to get into Workbench, theoretically. This is the Amiga operating system. As you can see, it looks much like many other operating systems at the time. There are windows. I can double click to open things and I can see into them. I say it looks much like other operating systems at the time, but really we're talking about 1990. So Microsoft Windows was still in its infancy. I think version 3 would have been out on top of the line by then, but this is already established. This is pretty damn cool for when it is. It looks... A little bit like Windows 2.0. Who owned this one certainly made a mess of their layout. And this is made all the more difficult by the fact that my Amiga mouse isn't actually working, so I'm having to use a keyboard to move the cursor. We have a shell. Oh, which is the Amiga shell. Worryingly, I cannot remember how to use this at all. But it's like command prompt or terminal if you're in another operating system, often with no obvious way to close it. We've got system preferences where we can do all kinds of things. We can have settings and command lines and fonts and other exciting operating system things. The trash can. Windows hadn't come up with the concept of the trash can yet. And that reminds me, this is where I had a bug in Workbench, because if you dragged stuff to the trash can, filled your disk up, and they went to empty it, it didn't work. In fact, <laughs> you see here where the mouse is, 100% full. I suspect that means this same thing's happened on this disk, but there you are. We have the equivalent of control panel for the Amiga, all running off floppy disk. And as you can see, it's got settings like any other operating system, although it feels more like an operating system than I remember. Like some of this stuff changing the display mode wasn't even really accessible in Windows at the time. You've got to put that into context. But the time we were in Windows was just a really small layer on top of DOS, and it just did a pretty fixed resolution. And we've got ability to change resolution sizes and output and color ratios here. I mean, this is more advanced than Windows was at the time. And yet, I used it for what many people used it for. And that was, I did just play the rubbish games. It was all about Lemmings, which I wish worked because that was so the best game at the time. And it was so much more than that. This was such an advanced machine. However, when it came out, it was too late, too expensive. and irrelevant and that's why Amiga died. Bang and welcome to a word processor. This is a word processor. Now this might not exactly look amazing by current standards although admittedly the user interface does make slightly more sense than the ribbon in Microsoft Office. This was phenomenal for its time. This is a what you see is what you get or WYSIWYG as was very cool to say back then. Although admittedly the Y doesn't look very readable on here. Unlike most word processors of the time, uh, this is a visual word processor. What you see that you're doing here on screen is what comes out the printer or how the document's laid out. And that today is what a word processor is, but it just wasn't back then. Yes, you do have to wait whenever you want to change your font and try and find it on an actual floppy disk, but pretty cool for its time. This is 25 years ago, and this is what Word pretty much does now, so kudos to them for that. However, let's look at something slightly more interesting, and let's try a game. Here we have an example of early copy protection where rather than asking for a serial number to make sure you didn't copy it, they used to pick two random pictures from the manual. You'd have to figure out what they were and then type in a year from it. That was certainly a more creative way of dealing with copy protection than we have these days. This is one of my favourite games ever. This is the secret of Monkey Island. I spent many, many years of my youth playing this, not just because of the jaunty music. I thought the graphics were stunning. Stunning at the time in all of their 16 bit glory. Little did I realize how things would change over the coming years. Now, I could probably spend several hours playing this, 
but I'll leave it at just quickly showing the game. This led to a whole section of the games industry coming out with similar games like this. One of my favourite copies of it was Day of the Tentacle. And in essence, you have these wonderful graphics, you go and explore, you solve some puzzles, and not a lot happens. But it's very, very time consuming. But here you can see the wonders of the graphics that were available back to us in 1991. Now the game was pretty simple but it led to hours of fun. You selected a verb that you wanted to do, you selected where you wanted to go, and it did just that. You can carry on and have all kinds of fun. For example, shall we go into a bar? We can open the door. Then, oh, I forgot quite how much effort this is. We can go in thanks to the door. And then we wait some more. I think that probably sums up the experience of gaming back in the early 90s. I don't think we could have had something more authentic than what just happened. Well, with what I think there is the most authentic example of the 1990s gaming experience, something being broken after you've waited an hour for it to load, I have got my joystick out, ooh, that I also had in the 90s. I think this might be the very one that came with it. And I have a boxed game which promises to have not really been used. I can understand why, because this game was terrible. Yet it did come with my Amiga 600, and for that I will always be grateful for it. Two very white floppy disks. So let's see what an official game actually loads like. While that's loading, here's an example of the copy protection that we used to have back then. We would have a whole wheel that we'd turn around to find out a secret code, and that secret code would obviously let us start the game. Now, obviously, all you have to do is take that thumb scrap, photocopy it, and cut some holes, and you've got around copy protection, but hey, somebody thought it was a great idea at the time. My Amiga 600 came with both this and Lemmings when I got it, and I've actually never realized that it was in association with Chupper Chups before. That is something. He does look a little bit like a lolly, doesn't he? Maybe a, maybe, maybe some kind of licorice thing? I don't know. Could we eat him? Mmm. In fact, the box looks really rubbish now. This all looks a little bit rubbish now, but at the time, it did look amazing. This, if I recall, promises to basically be Amiga's version of trying to be something like Super Mario. It comes with its own comic book inside, in kind of anime style-ish, where Zool is a super ninja from the nth dimension. Who comes to Earth to do stuff. Hmm. Should we see what he actually comes to Earth to do? So, here we have the copy protection. We've got now Zool being blue and yellow, and we want window number 32, which is down there, which promises to be 46. And they've got around the copy protection here by putting black print on a black background, which also works for protecting it over time, as it's very difficult to read. Should we see if that worked? Oh, we have Chupa Chupsy Zool! Ah, oh, there we are. Copy protection in. We've got the jaunty music of the 90s. It's amazing to actually see a game that's actually only been written by a couple of people, where obviously the software developer got the top score. Let's have some fun! I say let's have some fun. Actually, let's insert another floppy disk. We haven't even got as far as being into it yet. Let's try now. Why? Why would you not put your first level on the first disk? It makes no sense. I am preparing myself, though. This is quite trippy music. I really hope this comes out on the microphone. If not, this might actually be as good as my theme tune. However, all this is is a loading screen. The floppy disk light is carrying on. There was a lot of this back then. I think if I'm honest, the memory is better than it actually was, having gone through it again. Right, here we are. Are we ready for the Amiga version of trying to be Sonic slash Mario? I just, I don't have high expectations for this. I'm still getting ready. I'm still getting ready. Oh, apparently press fire was the answer. Ah, oh, here we are, and we're off. Oh, yep, this is basically Mario, isn't it? Oh, apart from... I've got a gun of some kind. 
Oh, yeah. Hello, Mario Ninja. Oh, take that. So what you can see here is basically Super Mario, but with sweets rather than plumbers. And apparently he can defy the laws of gravity. Watch this. I can jump left and right in midair. Oh, and I'm dead. I don't think we're going to play that for much longer. But that's actually surprisingly enjoyable, considering I thought how rubbish it was going to be. It is just another generic clone of what had already been done before. But I will say the graphics on this are really nice and colourful. Now, bear in mind, this is so long ago, and I'm actually quite enjoying this time into it. Can I get to the end? Can I find a boss? I'm just going to keep running until I either die or live forever. Oh, there was a bomb thing. There's sweets everywhere. There's, there's uh, licorice all sort attacking me. I'm going to leave it there. But that was Zool. That was one of the two games I got with it. I remember that being extremely fun, but I also know I was never any good at it because I've never been good at gaming. So what did we learn from that? Not a lot. If I'm honest, we learned that floppy disks rot over time and don't work very well and that my recollection of the past was probably more exciting than it was. That aside, there are a few things I do really want to take away from this. Firstly, that probably wasn't the best example of what an Amiga 600 can do. It was a couple of games and a quick, very, very quick look at the operating system. This had a full operating system. It had a hard disk you can install it onto. I mean, we are talking operating system on a par, really, with Windows 3 in many ways. We saw word processing. There's games. There's a lot on there. And... The truth is, most people, myself included, used it as a gaming platform. Any of you guys that are in the States, you are going to be primarily used to kind of SNES and Sega worlds where it was all cartridge-based. Well, actually, we were still using computers as gaming devices with floppy disks um, and cassettes well into the mid-90s. Yeah, we had cartridge machines, but the bulk of gaming up until... probably up until the... PlayStation 1 came out, was these kind of computers. Obviously later, 32-bit PCs, but it was definitely computers rather than games consoles. I had an Atari 2600, and then I was like, why would I want one of those when I have an 8-bit computer or a 16-bit computer? But this was a full computer. You could do a lot with it. And let's give it credit. I mean, we're talking something from 25 years ago with a PCM-CIA socket on. Now for the wrong side, PCM-CIA socket on. For the younger of you watching this, you won't know what that is. But imagine the USB-C of its time. It was a very, very small way, in terms of socket size, to connect peripherals to a laptop device, where you didn't want to have, even previously, ports were all this kind of size, with incredibly slow data transfer. And suddenly, you've got one of these. And early wireless network cards used these. Ten plus years later, I was using a PCMCIA wireless network card in my first laptop that I had connected to wireless. So it was ahead of its time, but it was also behind its time because it was a 16-bit computer in a becoming 32-bit world. It was three-year-old technology for many aspects of it. I mean, the Commodore had the better graphics ready and good to go, but they didn't release it because that's not how the pipeline of the 1980s worked. But it wasn't the 1980s anymore, and they just never caught up. And it's a real shame. I think all the things that are positive about this, though, the bulk of them, you've got to remember, they're from the Amiga 500, which is even older than this. So we're talking about something that's, you know, 25-plus years old then. So pretty far ahead of its time. However... This is going to be relegated to the obscurity bit of history. I think very few people are ever going to care about this particular model of Amiga. And I'm certainly going to remember it with pride. But I don't think it's going to be a core part of my world moving forward. I'm going to stop doing anything with the Amiga now. Because I don't have enough software to show it off properly. And I've had two failed attempts at making interesting videos about this. So you've got the one where I wash it. And then you've got one where no software loads. I am not calling myself an Amiga expert. In fact, I have failed to show more than the basis of it. But I hope you get some, some vision, at least, of my excitement for one of my first computers. And I should probably stick to the world of PCs. Although, 
BBC B, I will show that off because I know that fully works as a refurb and I have almost every bit of software ever for it in a working state. So we'll do that in a later video. If you did happen to like this video, hit like. If you thought it sucked, I don't blame you really because none of the software works. Hit dislike and I would love you to watch some more of my videos and stay tuned because there's some good vintage stuff coming up on the Commodore 64, which is a counterpart of this, the earlier 8-bit version from the same company. Uh, same version. The earlier mass computer from the same company. I'm planning on trying to write a web server to run on it connected to a wireless network. Now, obviously, that's quite a challenge, but that's going to be a multi-week project coming up in a few months' time. So do subscribe if you want to see some of the crazy stuff I will get up to with these vintage computers. And I hope you enjoyed this, and see you soon. Thanks for watching. Please check out some of my other videos. Don't forget to subscribe.